Okay, hello everyone. So uh, today I'll be talking to you about how we scale our Swift SDK at Algolia and some learnings that we had along the way. Uh, I was supposed to do this talk with uh, Robert, my colleague, uh, but unfortunately he's sick, so uh, he's not able to talk. But if you see anyone with a weird mask on his face, that's probably him. Okay, so uh, first I'll set the stage of uh, the libraries that we have so that you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, then I'll talk about three kinds of scalability. Uh, one for uh, related to the app architecture, uh, second is to, uh, for Objective-C support, and finally uh, related to CI and CD. So at Algolia, uh, we started around three or four years ago uh, with our first library, uh, the API client, that actually makes just the search request uh, to our search engine. So it was pretty simple at the beginning. Uh, I just took care of the retry logic and making the calls. But we wanted to make it easier for, uh, for developers out there to use our solution. So we introduced another library, the core, that takes care of the search session. So stuff like the state, sequencing, etc. So then we wanted to go further and create an instant search library which provides smart UI components and building blocks to actually build your search experience. Now, each of these uh, libraries depend on each other. So uh, the core depends on API clients, instant search depend on the core. And then we have some demos to be able to demonstrate what you can do with these libraries. On top of this, we have our third party dependencies. So how, how did we go around building these and what were the challenges? So the problems was First, we wanted to ensure that the core library supported all Apple platforms. That means Mac OS, iOS, tvOS, and watchOS. We wanted to ensure that the ease of extensibility uh, for platform-specific uh, UI libraries, in that case, Instant Search. We wanted to ensure as well that it works for both Objective-C and Swift. And we wanted to make sure that deploying these libraries is pretty safe and quick. So let's for, uh, first start by scaling the architecture. This, this was the state at the very beginning when we just had the client. Now, so it would just make the calls to Algolia and that's it. That would encourage kind of massive view controller. Uh, now, definitely it doesn't mean that they built it with MVC, they could have built it with anything else, but we just provided the simple networking logic and that's it. So then we added the searcher, which is the core that actually uses the API client and offered more advanced functionality to deal with the search state and, and more, more of that, and more advanced search uh, functionalities. So that led to less massive view controllers. Then we wanted to like offer ad more advanced uh, widgets and UI components, such as in this case, we have an infinite scrolling capability where the user scrolls down and as, his, as, he, as he scrolls, we actually uh, download more content from the other pages of the index. So we first provided it as like a in inheritance of UI table view. So we had this kind of widget. But then we realized that the same logic applies if you wanna, if you wanna actually offer it as a, in a UI collection view. To go further, let's say you also wanna want the same uh, functionality in an NS table view that is offered on Mac. So how did we go ahead and not duplicate our code to do this? So of course, the view models was one way to do this where we encapsulated all the business logic in there so that it can be shared with any kind of platform and even within like UIKit, for example, any kind of component that needed to reuse that. So at the end, the overview is like we have three libraries at the beginning, the core libraries that support all Apple platforms. And then we have a UIKit library and AppKit library that can reuse the view models and the business logic. And then we have the third party apps developed by our customers. So the benefit is that we are actually creating multiple framework in order to support more platforms. And we use the view models to share this, the specific logic. And actually that enforced us to ensure separation of concern 
uh, for each of these libraries and having cleaner interfaces uh, and encourage best practices, basically. Okay, now the second part of scaling was uh, for Objective-C. The problem was that a lot of our customers still use Objective-C. And believe it or not, a lot of the paying customers, the ways that pay the big money, actually are still using Objective-C. And we have to cater for them uh, as a framework uh, provider. Now, some of you know that going writing your code base in Swift and making it accessible in Objective-C is not that straightforward. Like you can, uh, the gen generics, enums, and structs functionality is not bridgeable there. And so that provides a lot of challenge for us. So I'm gonna tell you some tips on how we dealt with that. First and foremost, we made sure that our code base is still using like, the key features of Swift that we love, such as generics and all. And then what we do is we think of Objective-C as a, a second layer where we add more supportive code to provide the basic functionalities that we want to make available to our customers. Let's take a very simple example just to get you an idea of what I'm talking about. So for example, we have a property called length that has as a type an integer optional. This type is not bridgeable to Objective-C. So what can we do about it? So we create a new property. We put at Objective-C length, which is the name that is accessed in your Objective-C code base, which is the same as the Swift one. We put the type NS number optional, which is actually bridgeable to Objective-C. We name it in such a way Z Objective-C length. And we actually, the reason why we do this is uh, is why we prepend it with a Z is because it will actually appear in the Swift code base and it auto complete many of X codes. So we make we put Z so that it appears at the end. And finally, we make sure that the setter and the getter of that property uses the self dot length defined above as its source of truth in order to reduce uh, bugs. A second tip that we use for scalability is making sure that we write Objective-C unit test to test just at the interface level the APIs that we want to make available to developers. And that way we can detect methods that are not accessible for Objective-C developers and catch up some bugs that happen pretty uh, quickly. A fi final tip that we use is to use a certain linter rule. And the lint by linter, for those of you who don't know, it basically scans your code base for programmatic and stylistic errors. And what it can do is raise warnings when it detects that a certain function, for example, or, or method or a property is not bridgeable to Objective-C uh, and that it's public. So it, it can tell you uh, whether you wanna keep it public or not. Okay, so finally, let's move to the scaling with continuous integration and continuous delivery. So the problem there was we released three libraries plus the demos, and it was a, a big pain uh, to do this. So some of the pain points were the versioning, dealing with all the versioning of all those libraries, making sure to test on all four Apple platforms, deploying them to Cocoa Pods, and then the worst part, which happened quite some time, is that a dependent library could actually break, uh, could break due to the release of its dependencies. So what did we, do we use to actually solve this? So we love Fastlane and Bitrise, and we use them extensively for that. So a lot of you use Fastlane basically for, for apps, but they actually have good tools to, uh, to be able to be used with frameworks and libraries uh, in Swift. So we use Fastlane to run the tests for each of the four platforms. We use them to manage the release versions of the, uh, the library version and the CocoaPods version. We use them to generate documentation through the use of Jazzy. And then finally, it ensures the release with podlib lint and, and uploading to actually CocoaPods. So the commands, for example, that we use are Fastlane with the platform name and then test, for example, to test for the specific platform. And then Fastlane deploy the type and then one of the three labels patch minor or major depending on the use case. 
So where do we host and run those tests and deploy? So it's Bitrise in our case, which is specifically a mobile continuous integration platform. So we have three kind of workloads there, uh, testing, integration, and release. And let me talk about each one pretty quickly. So first for the testing workflow, uh, what Bitrise offers you is some components and small blocks that run a specific, uh, th that do specific things. So in this case, at the beginning of the testing workflow, we have first activation of SSH, SSH key, uh, cloning the repo, installing the dependencies, creating the test certificates. Then what we do is we actually run a fast lane iOS test, for example, to first te test the iOS test. If that fail, we stop there. But if uh, if it, it succeeds, we go on and do the other the other test. Of course, we could parallelize these, uh, but that's for another uh, topic. The second thing that is interesting is our integration workflows. That after the test run, as we said, a, de a dependent library could actually break due to one of the dependencies. So what we do is. We have a step to set an environment variable of the uh, of of the name git dependent commit hash, so it will actually set the value of the commit hash of the specific uh, build that was made. So, for example, we have uh, the client that is building, and we take the commit hash, and then what happens as a next step is it triggers the workflow of the next library. So, in that case, the core library, the second one. And what it will do is it will export and send this commit hash to it so that it can build it. So on Fastlane, what you would do is you would use this hash of the dependency and you would fetch this dependency with this hash and build it to make sure that nothing, nothing is broken. And the same will happen to the succe successive libraries. The final step is, so once everything is, te is tested and we decide we want to deploy, we actually run a Fastlane deploy, um, which is uh, does a bunch, bunch of steps to actually upload uh, for to Cocoa Pods and whatnot. And we use the uh, Bitrise git tag, which is the tag of the, of the build that was made, uh, in order to specify whether it's a minor, major, or, or patch. So that's basically how we release today. Uh, get tag dash a, then the label patch, minor or major, and then you just push that label to uh, origin. So the biggest win is really we reduce our manual labor to just writing that command that I showed. We can really release early and often, and the testing become really mandatory there. And the nicest thing uh, for me at least is like all this end-to-end -end testing to ensure that nothing no library is, is breaking the others or even the demos. So to sum up like, all the points of my talk, really having multiple modular extensible libraries can be a good thing. Yes, it's more, it's more um, burden to actually maintain, but it can give you uh, like support for more platforms, um, separation of concern and more. Uh, don't really forget your Objective-C friend because there are still customers there that still use it. And finally, really ensuring a good CI-CD system for managing a Swift SDK is of pure importance. As the next steps of what we're like trying to look into is exploiting those view models logic. Like we want to make it uh, in such a way where the community could be able to build easily widgets at the instant search level, like the third UI library. Um, we're thinking of nice way for it to be easy and for our libraries to be easily uh, extensible enough for them to be able to contribute to the library. And then a lot of the interesting functionalities in the client and the core libraries are still not observable or accessible and we want to make we want to make those actually accessible. And we were playing around with I mean maybe reactive uh, practices to be able to observe stuff there. And actually, that's like in, uh, an interesting discussion that we can have uh, after the talks. Uh, so feel free to come by if you have good ideas. And that's it. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask.
<rire> T'es le plus proche. Uh, hi. Um, so you say that uh, deployment is uh, related to pushing tags. So is it a continuous deployment or manual deployment? And uh, how do you deal with um, uh, errors? For example, when you push a tag and you have an error in the build and stuff like this, do you release uh, another tag? Do you override the tag? Do you, uh, how do you handle, handle these kind of things? Yeah, okay, so uh, for, um, so we have a hook on Bitrise. Basically, you can define some hooks of when tag minor patch or major are actually pushed. Some uh, build will happen. So that's what we do. When one of these is actually triggered, there's a hook that will actually trigger the workflow that we just discussed. In case of error, so we make sure that, uh, I mean, if there will be an error, uh, then the deployment, the it's only at the last step that we deploy the library. So if there was an error, then it will st everything will stop, and so we uh, like the new version will not happen. But yes, for the case uh, you're right, we will have to override the the tag uh, in order to to re-trigger a new version. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello. Um, do um, do you your uh, iOS code base uh, is uh, open sourced? Yes. And um, how how do you manage uh, pull request from uh, the community? Um, and uh, how do you merge uh, what uh, the community uh, add to the to the framework? Yes. Uh, so yes, they can actually. Uh, push, I mean, yes, they can uh, offer pull, pull request. Uh, they everything will run as normal. So when there is a pull request, uh, things will run on bit tries to check that everything is actually working fine. All the tests are running correctly. And if everything is uh, green, then uh, if any would like the PR, we go for it. So, and we're very happy if you can, we encourage you if you can contribute to the Algolia Swift SDK. Uh, why uh, do you use uh, Fastlane to launch your tests and not uh, just Bitrise? Uh, so basically, uh, I mean, Fastlane will is, so Bitrise is actually hosting Fastlane, the code that is being run. Uh, and so yeah, in, in order, so since we want to avoid hosting it on our machine, we're just doing it on Bitrise. Uh, yeah, that's the main reason. You want to add something? Yeah, yes. Add something. Because we, we want the control component uh, system to be agnostic. Uh, so if tomorrow we're, before we're making static, uh, then we found some bucket of tags from Bitrise. If tomorrow we want to move to something else like body build, um, all the code is going to be in one place, mm, okay. uh, and all these are just shared around with the file stuff. OK, thank you. Hi. Um, with so many uh, clients to support, uh, did you think about using uh, C++ for uh, uh, sharing code between all your clients? And if mm, yes, but the, the final decision was uh, not using it, why? So uh, first of all, we do have, was there something I didn't mention? Like we do have some C++ code, like as an extension of the first library, we have like the offline SDK, which actually is written some like, some part it uses C++ code. Uh, what the reason is, uh, the reason why we didn't do it because at, at the end of the day, uh, the li the library the cl the client was is just making network requests and and doing retry logic. It wasn't worth it to write it in. I mean, it, it was enough to do it in Swift. Uh, and yes, so you're talking about the Objective C part. Uh, so we have we actually uh, wrote a big blog post on because we initially actually had an Objective C uh, library and we decided to move with the flow of trying out on an adventure on trying out the Swift uh, writing it in Swift. the The conclusion of that blog post was, hey, actually maybe we shouldn't have we should have maybe stayed with Objective C uh, today because of some of the problems of uh, ABI uh, stability and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, like it's. It's sub very subjective. Like, we went for it. There are some learnings. There's pros and cons. But yeah, we could have actually stayed in uh, in C plus plus slash Objective C. Yeah. Uh, 
um, uh, how do you manage a different package version? For example, let's say that you had a, a new version for your uh, API, uh, AP, uh, AP uh, does it uh, automatically increase the dependency for the core? And how do you handle this? That's a, that's a good question. For, for now, what we do is we specify that, for example, the core is basically will depend on up to, for example, will take the ver version, let's say 3.1. So if there are new patches that are happening, then it will automatically like take the newest one. Uh, for today, we manually change when it's major. So when there's major change, we need to manually go and do it. Since it's once per year, we're at least as a safety measure, we're doing it. Um, but yes, like we, we, we were thinking of, hey, when there is a new library that is being deployed, uh, then up, uh, update all the pod specs of all the libraries. We still don't do it uh, because we don't feel the need to now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. And, uh, but today that's what we do basically. Thank you.